Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Rodney already brought us to the throne, so we're already there. So we just say thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God, for bringing us out here tonight. Thank you for filling our hearts with your love, with your presence. You are here. There is no doubt about it. And we know that you're here. We're grateful that you're here. We thank you. We pray that what comes out of me is what you want to come out and that it's received with joy and love by all who hear it. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Everybody having a good day so far? Mm -hmm. Good. Pastor Ray, I have a question. You have to answer it. Yes. Why did Jesus come to earth? To destroy the works of the devil. Praise God. Praise God. <laughs> He's been preaching about that. I knew he'd know that. <laughs> 1 John 3, 8 says, But the Son of God came to destroy the works of the devil. The Passion Translation puts it like this. The reason the Son of God was revealed was to undo and destroy the works of the devil, which is a fulfillment of the promise in Genesis 3, 15. When God said to the serpent, I will cause hostility between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring, he will strike your head, and you will strike his heel. So if you have your Bibles, open them up to Mark chapter 5. We're going to read, we're going to do, this is a little bit of expository preaching. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but basically it's a pretty fancy word. It just means that we're going to go through, we're going to go through these first 20 verses and we're going to look at this incredible story. Also, Luke 8, 26 through 39, and Matthew 8, 28 through 34. This, this story is in all three of those places. But we're going to be looking at it from Mark, Mark's view, uh, which I love it. And, um, which translation and I'll, do you have, Mark? Well, I'm going to be reading from the Passion Translation. I'll read it to you. But you can, as you as I go, I'll, I'll let you know where I am so you can keep up if you've got a different translation. Mark what? What? Right. Mark 5, starting at verse 1. So, um, we pick up the story of Jesus. He has just spent the, the day teaching, the previous day teaching, a huge crowd of folks on the shore of the Sea of the Galilee and now decides to cross the sea to the southeastern side. Now, that side of the lake is not the same as the western side. The eastern side of the Sea of Galilee has got people who are not, who are not necessarily Jews. So along the way, they encounter this terrible storm and um, which threatens to swamp their vessel, hello, warrior. And meanwhile, Jesus is asleep in the back of the boat, and they wake him up and are afraid for their lives, and he rebukes the storm, and all is calm. And then in the morning, it starts chapter 5, verse 1, they arrived at the other side of the lake, at the region of the Gerasenes. Now, there's a bit of debate about this. Some translations say the Gadarenes. Some, be, some versions say Gergesa. There was a, 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 a town not too far from the, from the sea there called Gergesa. So, it's the southeastern side of the Sea of Galilee, okay? And um, these were, like I said, non-Jewish folks who were generally considered unclean by Jewish laws. Uh, so we'll pick up, continuing. As Jesus stepped ashore, a demon-possessed madman came out of the graveyard and confronted him. 
The man had been living there among the tombs of the dead, and no one was able to restrain him. So clearly they had tried. Okay? Numerous times. For every time they attempted to chain his hands and feet with shackles, he would snap the chains and break the shackles in pieces. He was so strong that no one had the power to subdue him. Day and night he could be found lurking naked in the cemetery or in the vicinity, shrieking and mangling or cutting himself with stones. Get this guy in your head. Get the picture of this man. This pitiful creature. He is a bad neighbor. Okay. The people of the town are unhappy with this guy. He represents everything bad. Okay? First of all, he's ridiculously strong. He's superhuman strong. He's loud. He's belligerent. He's filthy dirty. He lives among the caves, the, the cemetery caves, where people are dead. He's naked. He's cutting him. He got sores and scabs, cuts all over his body from self mutilation. He's yelling and screaming all day, all night, from the torture that he is enduring. He's starving, th thirsty. His hair is like wheat. His skin is peeling off of him. He is a horrid mess. This guy, this guy, as I began to put this together many months ago, God has just impressed and given me pictures of this, this man. So picking up at verse 6, when he saw this guy, when he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran to him and threw himself down before him, shrieking out at the top of his lungs. Now, I don't want to destroy or, or obliterate your sensibility, so I'll just hold this out. But it was probably something like, Leave me alone! Jesus, Son of the Most High! Swear in God's name that you won't torture me! So that's how Jesus is greeted when he gets out of the boat. <laughs> he steps on the shore, and this man sees him and comes flying over and is screaming, shrieking. This, this man that we just described. Swear in God's name that you won't torture me, he said. For Jesus had already said to him, Come out of that man, you demon spirit. So clearly this man is demon possessed. Now what's interesting to note is that the demons immediately sensed who was coming out of the boat. They know the true identity. And they knew a day of judgment was coming for them. In fact, Mark's Gospel gives us 12 accounts of Jesus defeating, casting out demon spirits. They always recognize Jesus as God's Son. Sadly, many people today have yet to realize who Jesus is. And... Uh, Take that up with God when the time comes. Yep. Verse 9, Jesus said to him, what is your name? And again, in the Passion Translation, it says mob, he answered, or legion. It, it, it works. Now, a legion is a military, a Roman military term for a unit of more than 6,000 men. 
he goes on, they call me mob or legion because there are thousands of us in his body. <laughs> you know, one demon is, is one too many for me. Okay? But imagine thousands in this one person. It's no wonder he was a complete and utter mess. They begged Jesus repeatedly not to expel them out of the region. Luke's gospel says, we beg you, don't banish us to the bottomless pit of the abyss. Now, why would they say that unless they know? what's coming. And if you read in Revelation 9, 1 and in 20 verses 1 through 3, you'll read that the abyss is the place of imprisonment for Satan and his demons. Yay. They knew that time was coming. They were afraid it was going to be then. Nearby there was a large herd of pigs. Verse 11. Nearby there was a large herd of pigs feeding on the hillside. The demons begged him, send us into the pigs. Let us enter them. So Jesus gave them permission, verse 13. And the demon horde immediately came out of the man and went into the pigs. A couple things here. How amazing is it that Jesus answered the request of the demons? Unless he knew exactly what was going to happen, which of course he did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, this mass exorcism is an astonishing miracle, demonstrating the authority and the power of Jesus. And as a side note, if he will answer the request of demons, how much more will he answer our prayers when we come to him? 2 Chronicles 7.14 says this, you all know it. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and restore their land. These people could have had that. We'll get to that in a minute. So verse 13 says, this caused the herd, once the 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 demons left the man, these thousands of demons, they went into the, the, the herd of pigs. <coughs> <coughs> this caused the herd to rush madly down the steep slope and fall into the lake, drowning about 2,000 pigs. You gotta get this. You gotta get this visual, okay? Picture in your mind 2,000 pigs on a hillside. 2,000! Okay? All of a sudden, wham! Thousands of demons have just possessed their bodies. And they are freaked out. And what do they do? They run down the hill. Now, I don't know if you know much about pigs, but I married a farmer's daughter when I was a young man. And he raised pigs, part of what he did. And I would go back and help him feed the pigs and stuff. Well, they're big and they're loud. They don't make that cute little oink oink sign, oink oink, that you know we teach our children. Oh no, uh uh, pigs are loud. They have a guttural. I can't even do it. They they they're like insane. You know, especially if they're aggravated. They want to get to the food and they can't get to the food. They, they, they get feisty. They fight each other. They're, they're, they're cranky. So now there's 2,000 of these beasts filled with demons screeching and screaming and whatever they're doing, the sounds they're making, on their way down into the water and then they fall off of the cliff and into the water and drown. 2,000 of them. So picture yourself watching this. 
these pigs, possessed, screaming, screeching, coming down the hill, stampeding like a stampede, like a stampede of elephants or, 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 or buffalo, just coming down the hill and then falling into the water and drowning. And now there's the Sea of Galilee was turned into a sea of pigs. Like 2,000 pigs. The, I'm telling you, the people around there that watched it, including the disciples, must have just been out of their minds. Must have just been completely overwhelmed at this sight. Here's a little math for you. Hold on. At roughly 265 pounds each, that's the average weight of a pig at market. And a fair market value of $3.50 per pound, it's about what it goes for, between that and $4, but $3.50, let's call it that. The cost of 2,000 pigs today would be just under $2 million. Right? You got that? Yep. Now, of course, that wasn't the cost then, no. but it was relative to those days. The economic cost and impact to that community over the loss of this herd was monumental, was mind-blowing. So we're going to talk about that later. Back to our text Verse 14 says, now the herdsmen fled to the nearby villages. <laughs> Can you just see them standing there watching this? And be like, huh? Shoo! Off they go. <laughs> Telling everyone what they saw as they ran through the countryside. And of course, everyone came out to see what had happened. When they found Jesus, they saw the demonized man sitting there verse 15, properly clothed and in his right mind. Now Luke says they discovered the notorious madman totally set free. I love that. Because isn't that what Jesus does? Isn't that the essence of why he came? To destroy the works of the devil, devil and set us free. He was clothed speaking intelligently and sitting at the feet of Jesus. And they were shocked. The demonized man was completely delivered from his torment. Now, mind you, this guy had been there. One of them, I think it's Matthew, says he'd been there a long time. A long time he'd been in those caves and those tombs. And they had tried, they being the, all of the surrounding people who could hear him every night. You know how a dog irritates you? Like your neighbor's dog yes. just barks, yes. just goes on at night, especially when you're like, dude, you gotta, you know. This guy was way, way worse, screaming in these caves, and they had tried, and, and now he's completely delivered. So they were flipped out. So as I was preparing this message, the Holy Spirit showed me how this scenario probably played out. Now, this is not scripture what I'm going to share with you. This is me. This is just me, what I, what I see in my spirit. So after Jesus cast out this legion of demons, what was left was a pitiful sight indeed. This woeful man was now set free. And as he stands there before Jesus, let us get a picture of him. He is weak from lack of food and sleep. He's dehydrated. He's in pain from all the abuse and self-mutilation the, the, the demons had, had him inflict on himself. He's 
stark naked, filthy dirty, reeking of the stench of the demons, dazed and overwhelmed with what has just happened to him. His head is no doubt spinning as his mind begins to return to normal, which he hasn't been for years. And as he looks at Jesus and begins to weep uncontrollably, he crumples to the ground. He is overcome with a myriad of emotions. He is alternately grateful, embarrassed, elated to be free, sorrowful as he remembers his family. And you know what Jesus did. You know it as well as I do. He picked him up. And I'm sure he held him in his arms for a long while. And then he healed his scars and his wounds and cuts. And he led him to the shore so the man could bathe. And he instructed one of his disciples to get him some clothes and some sandals. I'm sure they gave him some food and some drink. Doesn't it remind you of the Father? In the story of the prodigal son, when the son returned, the Father put a fine robe on him, called for a feast. And this is what Jesus does. He said in himself that he can only do what the Father does. So verse 15 says, seeing what had happened to the man who had thousands of demons, the people were terrified. Yeah, I'll bet they were. Those who had witnessed this miracle reported the news to the people and included what had happened to the pigs and how the demonized man was completely delivered from his torment. Then they asked Jesus to leave their region. Uh, Luke says it like this, after hearing about such amazing power, the townspeople became frightened. Soon all the people of the region of the Gerasenes and the surrounding country begged Jesus, begged him to leave them, for they were gripped with fear. Why would these people want him to leave? So, it's possible that this, the people of this region worship the sow goddess from Egypt. And the swine herders possibly were soothsayers and shamans, predictors of the future, you know. And the mass suicide of the pigs proved that the Son of God <coughs> excuse me, had superior authority over the principality of that region that confronted Jesus the moment he came onto their, onto their shore. Yeah, they wanted him to leave. He was way more powerful than whatever it was they worshipped. In any event, the people preferred pigs to the Son of God. And there is no indication that Jesus ever went back to their land. Here is another thought <clears throat> that I came across just the other day. Some historians believe that no one person would have a herd of 2,000 pigs. Too much money. But that they were raising them for the Roman army for food. And that demon-possessed man had called himself legion, which is a Roman term. 
So then it is posited that Jesus stymied the oppressors who were occupying the Holy Land and destroyed a significant food supply at that moment. So just a thought. So verse 18 says, And as Jesus began to get into the boat to depart, the man who had been set free from demons asked him, Could I go with you? Luke says it like this, and, and, and I believe this is a little bit, probably a little bit more true to what happened. Luke says, but the man who had been set free begged Jesus over and over not to leave, saying, let me be with you. And I think that's the response. I think that's the response that most any of us would have after being freed from bondage like that. Please, please let me stay with you. It was Mary Magdalene's response after Jesus cast out the seven demons from her body. She stayed with Jesus. He had different plans for her. She remained with him throughout his entire ministry and in fact was a primary source of funding. Verse 19 says, Jesus answered, no. But said to him, go back to your home and to your family and tell them all the wonderful things that God has done for you. Tell them how he had mercy on you. So the man left and went into the region of Jordan and parts of Syria to tell everyone he met about what Jesus had done for him and all the people marveled. The first evangelist to the Gentiles. Now, in the Passion translation, it says Jordan and parts of Syria. Um, the, 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 uh, the correct word is the ten cities, the decapolis of the ten cities. It was a region, these ten cities were Jordan and parts of Syria, or included, and, 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 and including Damascus. These cities were Greek and Roman cultural centers of that day, and I just think it's a miracle of grace that, that Jesus used a man who once had been possessed with thousands of demons to bring God's truth to thousands of people. After he was set free, he became the first missionary evangelist to the Gentiles, telling others what Jesus the Christ had done for him. No wonder the people marveled when they heard his witness. As a final thought, let's look again at what Jesus told the man from the Gerasenes when he asked Jesus to stay with him. He said, go back to your home and to your family and tell them all the wonderful things that God has done for you. Tell them how he had mercy on you. So compare that with Matthew 28, 18 and 19, also known as the Great Commission. Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And Luke 24, 47 and 48 says, Jesus speaking right before he ascended into heaven. He says it was also written that this message, the message of his death and resurrection, would be proclaimed in the authority of his name to all the nations beginning in Jerusalem. There is forgiveness of sins for all who repent. You are witnesses of all these things. This man, this formerly demon-possessed man was a witness to the power and the love of Jesus. 
It's very similar commands that Jesus gave that formerly demon-possessed man. Nothing complicated. Very straightforward. No five-step programs for reaching the lost. <laughs> Go home to your family and friends and tell them the wonderful things God has done for you. That's it. That's the instruction. That's it. In other words, be a witness. Literally. Yep. As he says in Luke, be a witness to others of what God has done for you. That's the instruction. That's what it means to share Jesus. Nothing outrageously difficult. Tell people what God has done for you. That's our commission, simply put. And that's your takeaway tonight. Tell people the wonderful things God has done for you. Be his witness. For the time is slipping away. Amen. Daddy, we are so grateful that we have an opportunity to be your witnesses, to share our story with others. That they would, that they would be prompted by your Holy Spirit to come to Jesus for freedom, for salvation for the opportunity to be born again and become children, your children, brothers and sisters with Jesus. We are grateful that we have the opportunity to do that, to share our faith. We thank you for that. We pray that we would do it more and more and more and more fervently each and every day as the age comes to an end. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.